Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to talk to you for a few moments today. The title of today's message is Salty Living. Can we say that together as a group? Salty Living. And there's uh, so many applications uh, in the scripture alone about salt. I'm going to give you a little history of it, give you maybe a little better understanding before the context of this particular scripture. But in the Old Testament alone, uh, 35 times... Uh, the, the word salt or, and or describing salt and some application of salt was mentioned in the New Testament, uh, not nearly as many as 35, but we're going to pick up this scripture right in here in verse 13 of chapter 5, and, and this is right in uh, uh, what, what's commonly known as the, the Sermon on the Mount, and, and for chapters 5, 6, and 7, Jesus is giving, let's call it his, his first teaching, and uh, been fortunate enough to be over in Israel a couple times, and uh, uh, there, there's just a, a massive hillside right there. And how would you know that's the hillside? Well, because there's too many places within the Bible talks about that particular hillside, and it kind of just sets up like a natural little amphitheater. And Jesus is on the hillside, and and so many people have gathered to hear what's up with this guy. And, and he started with uh, the conversation talking about blessed, and and the Old Testament was. You, you must do this or don't do that. You must do this. You don't do that. And then you'll be blessed. And the, and the New Testament is, Jesus said, you, you, you're blessed as you just start to walk in the direction of God. And that, that's the covenantal change. Uh, but in verse 13, he, uh, uh, he begins a, a coupler, which is two sets of scriptures that go together. And I'm going to just go through the first one now. But he says, you are, talking to disciples talking to early followers you are not will be you are the salt of the earth and then he says but if the salt loses its saltiness how can it be made salty again it's no longer good for anything except to be uh, thrown out and, and trampled underfoot you know p ray that doesn't sound like what we call a seeker friendly message you know if just as jesus his lead off batting and and right away he says hey uh, if you lose your saltiness, um, it's, n it's no longer any good. It's, it's just got to be tossed out and, and thrown underfoot. So I'm going to give you some perspective on that, and you'll understand quite a bit better, I hope, through this. But one study showed that salt has more than 14,000 uses in life. I don't know about all that, but as I did research on it, over 14,000 uses, and some of them were just mind-blowing what, what salt is used for. And clearly in our lives, uh, we've never used it for some of those things. Uh, salt is used as a cleanser, a, a preservative. Um, salt is something across the board that influences uh, the flavor of food and everything it comes in contact with. Uh, it would also be used in, in many uh, places in the old days as currency, literally currency. Um, and, and I discovered this. Um, I mean, it's, you can look it up yourself, but we, we were recently away, and, and, and the last day of our trip in Europe, we were in Venice. And Venice is the place where you see the people cruising down in the, in the, in the water in between buildings and a gondola and some guy singing pizza pie, it's amore, you know, and the, the husband and the wife are like, oh, yeah, you know, the whole deal, or the, the, the boyfriend, girlfriend, and... Uh, it, it, was, it was amazing, and, and, and one of the things I came away with, it was our favorite city of all that we went to uh, for uh, one main reason for me, because the whole place was flat. Uh, every other city we were in was like this, and it seems like we started in every city, and you came into the main part of the city, you were up here, and you had to walk down a mile. And me being the, the, the math major that I am thinking, well, every mile I walk down, I got to walk back up at some point. And we were averaging, you know, eight, 9,000 steps a day, cruising, seeing. And, but when we were at Venice and, and, and then in the things we were seeing, and, and, and I didn't see a car, by the way, and not a car. It's just boats, you know, pick you up, boat, take you by boat, luggage by boat, the whole deal. And, um, but we were, we were in a, a cathedral seeing uh, just ridiculous uh, facility, churches, uh, facilities, and and the gal that was giving us our uh, tour uh, paused as she was saying, she goes, so what do you think Venice uh, was founded on uh, economically? What, you know, the, the currency and, 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 and what were we most known for? And there was four of us, and, you know, we kind of made comments. I mean, obviously, they're, they're right, right there at the head of the Adriatic Sea. I'm thinking, uh, how about fish? Yeah. You know, and uh, 
And they're like, no. And then, well, how about crops? No, because it's mostly swamp land back in, in those days. And, uh, and how about, how about, how about? And, and she said, no, we were, we were known for salt. We were the number one or number two largest producer of salt in the world, clearly the largest producer in all of Europe. And then she said, which is what I looked up this past week, but she said, and it was used as currency. So if I needed something from you, what you had, I didn't give you a check or I didn't give you, you know, cash or a rupee or whatever it was. You know, we, we traded, the exchange was, was salt. So salt, very, very important. And, and for many, many years, and even to this day, Venice has a huge, robust uh, uh, salt production thing. Um, did you know that salt, from a mineral standpoint, makes up 28% of your body? Uh, I didn't. Um, but according to Jesus, his words, he said, salt without taste becomes worthless. Reminds me of the scripture of his half-brother James, who wrote in James that faith without works is dead. You know, faith is what gets us into heaven Works is what comes after Christ comes to live in us. We, do, we don't work to get into heaven, but we do things differently now because Christ lives in us, and the love of God, as we talked about a few moments ago, is in us, and, and now it, it compels and, and propels us out to, to live differently. But Jesus said salt without taste is, is worthless. Salt without doing what it was designed to do is no longer good for anything. These are according to Jesus' words. But salt, just to just give you a little help, it was generally gathered from salt flats uh, or lakes, um, low areas generally. They would get into them, and, and, and then a, a salt block was literally formed in, in, in little forms and then cut out and, and carried in blocks. And, and when they did that, just so you know, it wasn't this pure block of salt like we think how many of you know what morton salt is you know the iodizer and you get it you know it'd be kind of weird if you poured it out and a little pebble kind of came out of it or a little bit of debris or sticks you know what would you think you'd be like let's throw that one away because ours is filtered and cleansed well theirs wasn't and and it, so it's taken out in blocks and and in it there's sediment you know the, the purity of the salt is there but also there's sediment in it and and so what would end up happening is in a household generally moms, right? Uh, they, they would take and, and they would break up salt because you don't use it in blocks. They'd break it up and they would put it in a little bag, not terribly different from this little uh, tablecloth here, uh, porous on some level, but not enough to let everything leach out. Pour, pour it in there. So, so now the salt's in there, but there's debris in the salt. And then there, she would tie a little string on the end of the bag and so this is how she would cook, a pot of stew or, or soup or whatever. She'd take the string and, and the bag with salt and, and just kind of dip it, you know, and, and leave it for a second or two in the soup or, you know, dip it or leave it in, in the salt or two. And then she'd taste it and uh, a little more and a little more salt and taste it. Ah, perfecto. And, and then put her salt bag away. So here's what Christ is talking about. At some point in time, this, this particular bag, this particular salt, it's, it's, it's running out. There, there's nothing left in there except what's left in this bag is the debris. It, it's that which is left over from the imperfection uh, of just being living life. And, and there's no longer any salt. So one of two things has to happen. More salt has to be put in so that it doesn't... Now it's lost its flavor. Salt as a preservative. You know, it was, it was also a preservative. It, it has to be put back in. So Jesus said, basically, in essence, so you know in the time, and, 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 and what he was saying is, hey, listen, that salt needs to be thrown out. It's good for nothing. And he even said it, it should be put where people walk because salt in and of itself, or remnants of salt, if he put it in a garden, by the way, it actually would prohibit you from growing anything in the garden. So in context, just so you know, that, that's kind of what he's, he's talking about there, but he's relating it to the disciples. And if I can be honest with you, they were no more the salt of the earth when he first met them and started talking to him than I am on the man on the moon. They were at the very beginning of the journey, but he is speaking prophetically. He is speaking as God speaks to you oftentimes in your life. He speaks to you in a way that you're like, that's not me. Who, me? Gideon is 
is, is behind a, a, a wall. He, he's, he's one of the men of Israel, and every year the men of Israel would plant their crops, but they had no weapons. And every year as the harvest was coming in of wheat, the, the Midianites, the, the enemies of Israel, they would come in and maraud. They would take everything they wanted or need. And, and there's nothing the Israelites could do. They didn't, have any, they didn't have any metal. They didn't have any swords. They didn't have any spears. And they just let them take it all. All their hard work, gone. And what was left was what the Israelites got to eat. And I did this series one time called Living on Leftovers. And I talked about my mom. My mom worked from the time we were little. And my mom used to make meatloaf monthly. And my mom would make multiple meatloafs. And, and she would freeze, you know, three or four meatloaves because it was just easy to, for my older sister to heat up for us or whatever. When I, when I finally fell in love with my wife, Mary Alice, and, 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 and she's like, we're just talking about life and whatever. And, and, and I said, listen, when, when we finally are, you know, married and what have you, I said, if you never cook meatloaf, <laughs> it's okay with me. If I never eat it, Again, in life, I'm okay with that. I ate more meat lo loaf than most people would know. And yet, it's been hilarious in our journey. Long before I was Pastor Ray, you know, people invite us over. We have friendships or whatever. And even as Pastor Ray, we go, you can't imagine how many times we go to somebody's house and what are we eating tonight? Meat loaf. <laughs> Shama, Hallelujah. And it's not like I don't like meatloaf. I, I do, but I just prefer, right? Preference, right? Uh, that, that not eat it. But, but here's, here's Gideon, and here's the first time you know about him in the Bible. He's hiding behind this wall, and he's gathering up stuff for his family. Every year, a guy just, just had a whole group of men come in and take everything they worked for. And he's right there, and God comes to him and says, through an angel, Oh, mighty man of valor. And what does he say? Who, me? And, and then the story unfolds as God was trying to speak into life, his life, where he wasn't was where he was going to become. And oftentimes, that's what God does with us. He speaks and he calls the things that are not as though they are. He's saying here, you are the salt of the earth. These people are looking up here and like, what? Because we, us, we, you mean we're the ones that are the, the, the people of influence? We're, we're the people of change. We're the change agent of God. We're, we're the things that are going to preserve our society, the three greatest things that salt does. But eventually, they realize that, like us, um, salt can be diluted. In other words, it can be minimized. Salt can also be polluted. So as Christians, we don't want to be diluting what God has put within us what he's made us for, what he's recreated us for. And we, we don't want to be polluted by all the ancillary things that go on in life. As Christ followers, we're looking to maintain preserving our influence and expanding it to those around us. So Salty Living is the title today, but Understanding and Expanding Our Influence is my subtitle for you today. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, another New Testament scripture talks about salt. Paul writes these words, Let your conversation, let, let your words... Be always full of grace, what? Seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Listen, everyone doesn't deserve the very same answer. You can't pull out your spiritual six-shooter with your six bullets in it and, and shoot them at people all at the same time. The Bible says, he who is wise wins souls. Sometimes it's as simple as just inviting somebody to church. You know, I've been speaking a lot in the past six weeks at a lot of different places, and, and yesterday my wife and I were at another place, and, and one of our folks was speaking, and she was talking in her speaking how for six years a couple was influencing her and, and her then uh, uh, father of her children, but boyfriend. And they, they were so subtle, and they didn't push, and they didn't jam, and they didn't pull out their six-shooter with the gospel, and they didn't drag them the first time they met them and say, hey, you, gotta, you need to be in church. What do they do? What we talk about, they earned the right to be heard. They begin to build a relationship. 
And what are you doing when you're building a relationship? You're just trying to build a bridge between people. Completely different lifestyles. Commonality. They were on the soccer field. Kids played soccer. They would see each other in a lot of things. But live in two totally different worlds, and yet they weren't these people either. Oh, we don't live like that. Oh, we don't do that. Oh, no, that, that's not what we do. For six years, they modeled being salt. They were influencing they, they, they let their words be seasoned with grace. And, and that's what we talk about at the church here. You know, if, if, if you're super harsh and you're super abrupt and, and, and you're super mean-spirited and fill in all the superlatives that you can negatively, just don't tell people you go to Beach Fellowship. Will you? Please just don't do that. Just tell them I go to church or something. But because what we're learning is we're, we're growing in those areas. And as I said before, I, I, I wasn't the most graceful person as a 19-year-old ball player in school. I mean, you know, just, we just live differently. But Jesus' admonition is our admonition. And this gal in our church and, and then her boyfriend came to church. They got radically saved with us. Their whole family and generation has changed and... They're in leadership in our church. It's just spectacular to realize it's not just inviting somebody to church. Sometimes it's going the process with people and waiting for the right time and, 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 and them seeing, man, these people are they're awesome. And, and, and then you have an opportunity there. But we also realize that salt creates thirst. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? Um, go to a restaurant, right? Some, and I, we'll leave them unnamed, but you can go to some restaurants, just awesome food, right? And you come home and you're like gulping gallons of water. You turn your, if you're married, you're like, oh my God, I'm so thirsty, me too. And why? Because we just ate sodium times 10, but it tasted good, you know what I'm saying? And uh, which, which for us, our lives should be lived in such a way that others would see what we're doing and, and they want to glorify God. They want to ask you, and, and I promise you this is not an advertisement. We have been asked so many times in our journey with Jesus over 42 years this question. Hey, what's different about you? I mean, I, I don't usually wear a sport jacket uh, out in public. Um, uh, I wear it, you know, or a, a suit and tie if I have to be at some place that calls for that. But we're just casual folks, live in life, earn the right to be heard trying to change the world, realizing that God has given us and made us all salty people to go live salty lives. So to preserve, ready to be influencers, and, and, and literally to create thirst in people. There, there, there's something about it that they see. But salt, so if you didn't know, is a crystalline substance that um, consists mostly of sodium and chloride. It's, it's abundant in nature. It's uh, used especially to season or preserve food. It's also used to treat, um, um, influenced by seasoning. It's used um, in brine and in, in saturating, uh, marinating. We talk about that a, a lot in life. It's, it's a, a brine is a solution of water and, and salt, and, and it can, you know, salt, beef, or fish. That's what they do. That's, that's how they kept things. They didn't have freezers and refrigerators. I don't know if you knew this or not, but if you were to take a drone today and and go over a lot of areas where animals are, you'll see tracks, long animal trails. We know this because we, we like to hunt. Please don't email me about liking to hunt. I mean, I love animals, but anyway, we like to hunt. But anyway, you can see long trails, animal trails that are cut in, in, in all woods and, and, and land all over the world that go to water, right? That will kind of makes sense. Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but you can find long trails where animals have cut in and they regularly go to where salt is. It's biologically necessary for them. Um, in, in Virginia, you can put salt blocks out for certain animals uh, for X amount of time in the year, and, and then you can't do it anymore. And the guys that are uh, trying to influence the game warden in the wrong way, they put salt blocks, uh, blocks out during the actual hunting season to, a, to attract the, the critters, and it does. And, uh, but it also tracks the game warden, so please don't do that. Follow along in that. It also gives flavor. Salt is mostly, though, sprinkled. This is, I thought, an interesting little thought. It's mostly sprinkled versus dumped, and in modest amounts at all times. So 
there's nobody in here, I'm sure, that ever did or participated in, but some of you might have saw uh, in your high school probably, may, maybe in, I didn't have a middle school, but maybe in elementary school. Uh, clearly none of you would have done it college or post-college, but where you, you unscrewed the top of the salt shaker and just waited for whomever to come, and as they grabbed it, <laughs> covered and uh, obviously ruinous to, to that meal, but it's supposed to be sprinkled. But I want to take this term here, influence, for a moment and talk to you about it. Jesus was speaking into their lives in the very beginning of his journey. He says, hey, you are my influencers. You're the influencers to the world. And influence is leading. Leading is influence. Let me give you a couple thoughts. You're a leader when you begin to take responsibility for another person in life. And all the parents in here say, amen and oh me. Uh, leadership is also developed when either you or someone else recognizes it and you begin the journey of growing. In, in leadership roles and responsibility. Jesus in uh, John chapter 10, verse 10 said, uh, I have come to bring life and to give life to all those that follow me more abundantly. And an application that I'd like to say is, is less uh, known and less talked about, but, but it's clearly his concept of abundant living is us influencing people and bringing in the multiplier effect. You see, the kingdom of God is not addition. It's 30, 60, 100-fold. The, the kingdom of God is multiplication. And, and the Bible says if one can put 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000, and the multiplication there is, is kind of scary and amazing. Yet at the same time with Jesus, he individually invited men to come follow him. In the Hebrew, leha harai just said, meant, come follow me, and walk on the, the, the wayside and see somebody, you want to come follow me? And it was the call of a, a rabbi, but still, you want to come follow me and, and learn my ways? And, and they, they, they rolled. And yet when he gathered his 12 after prayer and deciding, he didn't pick 12 perfect men, far from it. But, but he picked those 12 and he, and he began to pour into them and teach them. And, and then he got the number up to 70. And the Bible records for us, he gave very specific details as he sent the 70 out to, to go with the message of the good news. And, and as he did it, he sent them out in pairs. And in the beginning of reading those kinds of things, I often wondered, but then you start to read the, the Bible and says, you know, one can put 1,000, two, 10,000. It's the multiplier effect. If one's down, the other one lifts them up. It's, it's the, the, the commonality of two are better than one. All of this is found in the scripture. And this multiplier effect, I think, is specifically talking about abundant living. And it's not just abundant living for you as an individual. It starts there when you're like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, I opened my heart. Christ came in my life. I'm radically changed. I see through everything differently. That's what it's called being born again. And a whole new life begins in Christ because God is in you. But this overarching concept in the Bible is we, in the Bible, are, are one. In God's leadership directive of how he wants to influence the world is we who are many, ready? We are one. Why, why do we have like uh, times to gather together and, and consider being a member of, of, of this church? Look, there's plenty of great churches in, in Virginia Beach or Tidewater alone, you need to be in one and, and you need to be a member. Why? It says it in the scripture. God has called us to be members of a, of a body of Christ, a place that you get your roots down. And if it's not here, we want to encourage you to get somewhere. But if it is here, let's come on, let's do this thing. And how do you do that? It's as simple as understanding. You need to understand what people believe that are leading any entity. You don't, we don't say people just sign on a dotted line or make some sort of commitment because that's not what it's all about. We're looking for people that are of like-minded because we who are many are one. We're unified around many different things that we have to agree upon, and then we have a much longer list of things that, ready, we don't really care about. It's not, it's not our job to be the life police of everything in your life. No, learn how to possess your own vessel in honor before the Lord. You know, we, we've often talked about this. 
But here, here's a couple of scripture portions that I'm going to read out of the book of Acts. This is in the very beginning of the church. Follow along as God starts with individuals, spreads to more individuals of a like mind, then spreads and reaches out to the world, and then the uttermost parts. Acts chapter 2, verses chapter 1. I mean, chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together, all of them together, in one place, just like we are here today. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They'd been there 10 days following Jesus' words. Don't leave Jerusalem. I'm leaving, but don't leave Jerusalem. Pray until you receive the promise of the Father. What was that? That you're going to receive power as the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses to the world. And the Bible says they saw what seemed like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on what? On each of them. Starts with individuals. And then the very next verse. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And now it switches to tell us about this time of a, of a feast. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Why? Three times in a year, three times in your lifetime, you had to leave your home and come to Jerusalem. From every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. This was a super natural miracle that one of you, if you're on the, in the 120, and someone's up there from a region in Russia, you're speaking Russian, and you don't know any Russian. As you saw this morning, Pastor David, he speaks fluent uh, Spanish, Spanish uh, version dialect, uh, nacho business, or whatever he said. Um, you know, but these people are hearing it's a miracle. Utterly amazed, they ask, aren't these, all these guys that are speaking Galileans, that they're right from here. How is it that each of us hear them in our own native language? There were 15 different nations named there specifically, and, and these 120 people come out, and they're speaking uh, supernaturally to them and uh, glorifying God. This is where the promise of influence began. The Holy Spirit was poured out to each one first, and then to all of them being filled. Initially, Jesus personally invited individuals to follow him. He then trained them to go out and influence the world. Yet they sent him out together as one, one message, one thought, even though they're individuals. This was the promise of God living inside of people found throughout the Old Testament. One day he's going to come and he's going to write his message on the tablets of our hearts. No longer the stone tablets. They serve their purposes. Now he's going to write them on the fleshly tablets of their heart. And they're going to know me, every man from the greatest to the least. What happens, this is the transition from individuals to whosoever will. Next section, Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 41. Peter comes out, he's one of the 120. Remember, just days before he denied Christ, now he's filled with the Spirit of God, and he comes out and says, let all of Israel be assured of this. He, he's in Jerusalem, it's all Jewish people. That God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Savior, or Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut in their heart. And they said to the Peter, Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what do we need to do? That, that should be the response. The very first time you or I ever heard the gospel, and it was not my response. I had all the reasons in the world to think it's impossible to have a relationship with Jesus. It's impossible. I talked, I listened. I, I don't recall being rude at all, but I worked with the guy all summer. I was 15, he was 19, and I just couldn't get it through my head. And yet the issue was I had been cut in my heart, but I, I just didn't want to go there. Peter replied, this is what you do. Repent, which means change your thinking. Be baptized, every one of you. Listen, we had over 60 people on Easter Sunday in three services, make first-time decisions for Christ. If that's one of you, you need to follow up. Now, in believer's baptism, you do not need to go down here to the oceanfront and freeze. I mean, the water temperature is a smidge cool right now. We have heated, heated uh, baptismal here. We have pools in the church. We have people. But follow him. Follow. Go to the next step. 
And then get involved with the Word of God. Get involved in the church. Get involved in the life group. Come, come out to a discovery weekend and see what's going on. Follow with the next steps. It's not enough just to open your heart. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, not whoever feels like it. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promises for you and your children and for all who are far off and for all who the Lord God will uh, call. With many other words, Peter warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from, from this corrupt generation. Remember, they're the, they're, they're the salt of the earth. And, and part of salt is preservation, preserving. Part of, part of our role is we are the antidote for our society. P. Ray, the society is going to heck in a handbasket. Pastor Ray, if you read the news, yeah, hey, guess what? I also read the good news. I do not put my head in the sand. I don't live an ostrich life. I'm a voracious reader of all things in and outside of the church. However, my hope is in the Lord. And God's hope is in people. Average, ordinary people. Exactly like Gideon, the guy who was hiding. When God's speaking into our lives saying, You are my woman. You are my man. You're the one. You mean me? Yes, me. And then... What does he do? He gives us a view of how our life can influence more. It might be coming alongside a couple for six years. It might be coming alongside a person for six days. It might be writing a letter. It might be picking up a phone and calling. But what ends up happening is what has taken place inside of us has to come out of us. And the more we cork it, the more we put a cap on it, the more we press it down, the worse it gets for us. Because I've got the life of God shut up in my bones. If I never preach from a pulpit again the rest of my life, I would be okay with that. As long as I could share the gospel with anybody I come in contact with in any way, manner that I see fit. I, I, I would have no problem with that. I just want to honor God, but I want to win people to Christ. See their lives change, their generations change, their whole families changed. And that's the power of God. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to the church that day. So now from 120 people, their influence has spread to 3,000. Remember, there's maybe up to a million people in Jerusalem at that time. Of, of, of a million people, like, oh, 3,000. It's a big number. There's a whole other teaching on that. But with 3,000, as it relates to hundreds of thousands of people there, not a big number. But 3,000, who were they? The Bible says devout men and women from all the nations of the world together. What's a devout person? A person who is searching for God. And you may have searched for him in all sorts of places, seen all sorts of things. And you might be sitting here today saying, P. Ray, is it honestly possible? Is it really possible that if I open my heart to Christ and he came inside of me, that everything is going to change in my life? Absolutely yes. What isn't going to change is you're not getting any taller when that happens. By design, what God says is available to you as a Christian. You're a person of influence. You're supposed to be living a, a salty life. Influence is the power or capacity to cause an effect in an indirect and sometimes in an intangible way. You don't even know how you're affecting people's lives. It's the act of power of producing an effect without apparent exertion. I find that the more we're just flowing in the Spirit of God and walking and letting God do the work through us, the less flapping I have to do, the less hard work. Tact, what we teach around here as a church, you know what the influence is? For you, you need to be a tactful person. You know what that means is? After you've touched somebody with your words or your deeds, you have left them whole. They are intact. That's what being a person of tact is. That comes from working on your words, being at, hey, P. Ray, I got married, and, you know, uh, I'll, I'll use Mary Alice, this didn't happen, but, you know, my wife's Italian, so if, if we'd have got married, my wife was a big screamer or something, and one day she turned to me and goes, well, I'm Italian, we all yell. You know what I said? Hey, you're, you're, you're a woman of God, and we live in the kingdom of God, so you can set your Italian ethnicity of being a yeller aside. And that didn't happen, by the way, just so that's noted. No, doo, doo, doo. everybody hear that? But the reality is, you see what I mean? People come in and go, that's who I am. No, no, no. That's who you were. That's who you were. We're retrainable. And he's talking about losing your flavor. 
or, or, or not having it. You don't have to be that guy. You don't have to be that gal. God is in us. He's at work in us both to bring about his will and his good pleasure. And what does he do? He transforms us. But you've got to be willing to change your thinking. That's what repent means. Like, man, maybe I am not so great there. Maybe I'm home, home on the range where seldom is heard an encouraging word. And, and I need to change that. By design, influence. There's also corrupt influence. You know, we have more than our fair share of wonderful uh, law enforcement folks in our congregations. And uh, you could be under the influence, affected by a drug or an alcohol. You can be one that exerts overly uh, your influence or position. You want to take advantage of people. Um, so many opportunities to see out here. Let me, let me land my plane for today. But what speech fellowship? Um, we're a place where we build people. Uh, we build influencers. We encourage people that are broken or hiding, not what they could be, to come on and, and, and let us help build you. We're, we're building people to be influencers. We are at Beach Fellowship uh, building leaders by God's design. Because what is leadership? The first time I ever heard it was 40 years ago. I was at a Zig Ziglar, a motivational guy. And, and he said, let me define leadership for you. Leadership is influence. Just like salt. It influences everything that comes into. We're, we're all leaders, respectively, you know, in, in our own way. Salty living for us begins by living to influence others for God. So I, I'm not even going to read the, uh, the last. Yes, I am. I'm going to finish with uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. The very next thing that happens was now, now they have a group of people together, just a, a large group. And, and this is what they did when, when they made professions of faith. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's the word of God. To fellowship, that's the Greek word, koinonia. It means getting together with other like-minded people. You, you just can't, and I couldn't. You can't run the race with all the same people we ran with. You know, right? There's a place for everybody I used to run with. But my priority became being around like-minded people because we who are many are one. And you need a commonality. You need to discover who you are in Christ. There's 156 verses in the New Testament alone that say who you are in him, through him, or with him. Like, I am the righteousness of God in him. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In him, with him, and through him. 156 verses. If you don't know who they are, you're just walking along muddled in, in the journey. They devoted themselves to the apostle teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, like we did this morning, communion, and, and to prayer. And breaking of bread in this context could clearly also mean just getting together with other brothers and sisters and throwing down on some burgers and dogs or having some food and uh, hopefully not too salty. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All believers were together. And, and there's something that now new happened. They, they had everything in common. They even sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. It was uh, an extemporaneous thing that happened. It wasn't top down. Every day, right? This is what, what I teach here. Disciples do daily what, what followers of Christ do occasionally. You, you want to kind of daily have a little time to be in the Word, a little time to talk. If you have the benefit of having someone else in your life you can share with us, great. But every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts, it was outside of their home. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, for us, when it starts with you, it moves into building leadership families. The broken, healed people of, of Beach Fellowship, every, every church in the world, are, are, are the prime candidates for being people of influence. The broken healed. And guess what? There's no end and destination where you're all the way healed and it's all the way done and, and you never grieve or have pain or anything else anymore. But there are places to get to where you rise above 
this valley you've been living in or staying in or revisiting far too many times. God calls us to come to a place where he's going to set our feet on higher places, on, on places to walk and to be able to be productive in this life. And, and then we're sensing ourselves better. We're raising up generations of people that will repair the breach. And what is a breach? A breach is a, a broken area between what should be and, and what is. And oftentimes God just sends us as the church in between orphan boys in Bolivia that have no mom and dad for fill in the blank for whatever reason. We just come in and fill the breach or 450 boy, boys and girls in India. We, we just come alongside people that are in the breach and we fill in little gaps. Been doing that for 17, 18 years. Come alongside in Israel as God is drawing Jewish people from all over the world back to Israel for the first time in these last days revival. And what are we doing? We're shipping last, last month was 130 containers. And we're part of that beach fellowship of, of brand new goods and services over there for the poorest of the poor coming back from, from all nations in the world. That's who we're called to be. Repairs of the breach, people of influence, God's people on earth. Let's close today. Bow your heads with me. Father, again, thanks so much for today. And Lord Jesus, you, you said it. So we might not feel it, but today we're going to receive it, that we are the salt of the earth. We are the ones who have turned our hearts towards you. And just remind us today and, and, and reinvigorate or instill in us for the very first time, O oh, mighty man of God, O oh, mighty woman of God, you are the salt of the earth. And I have called you to be a part of something that's so much bigger than you because we who are singular are many. We who are many are one. We are part of this great, great rescue for humanity, and it's on. So, Father, I pray that you stir our affections within us here at Beach Fellowship for you and to revisit, Lord, the flavor of our life revisit the, the influence that we're having around people and look for opportunities to come alongside folks to hopefully win them to you or bring them to church. And God, we do this because this is what you designed us for. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said...